So welcome everybody to the second week of HCDE 521 UX Speaker Series. It's Friday the 13th, uh, and um, I think that means that it's going to be an extra excellent talk today. That's, uh, that's <laughs> my appointment for Friday the 13th. Uh, I am delighted to welcome Josh Lamar to uh, to our speaker series today. Um, Josh is the CEO of and co-founder of Amplinate, which is a UX design firm based in France. And he um, graduated from the department. So um, I'm trying to find your graduation date here in my notes. 2006. Thank you. 2006, <laughs> a long time ago. A um, long time ago. And um, since then has gone on to uh, build this really, really interesting firm. He started off at, at some of the big employers locally. I think what, Microsoft? Yeah, um, mostly Microsoft. And um, and uh, and then went on to start his own firm. And one of the reasons we really wanted to have uh, Josh join us for this series is because his journey is... Um, you know, the international component of his journey is one that we don't see all the time with our alum. And I thought it would be just a wonderful uh, story to hear how he got to where he, he is today. Um, and then also what it's like to do the kind of work he does in uh, in international and cross-cultural context. So welcome, Josh. Um, Thank you. I am going to start off by asking you just a couple questions about how you got to where you are. Uh, and first, um, how did you decide to start an international UX firm? What was that journey? <laughs> you know, it's funny because sometimes we need to leave in order to come back to the things that we love. And I had been at Microsoft for about 12 years and I was just like ready for a break. I wanted to take a sabbatical. I also had a midlife crisis and I had the best midlife crisis ever. And that involved quitting my job uh, deciding that I wanted to go move to France and study French and French poetry. Um, my background is actually in, uh, my undergrad is in English poetry and music composition. So even going into the master's program uh, in HCDE, back at the, in the day, it was called technical communication still at the time I was part of it. But, um, but even then it was kind of like a, a big shift for me. And I discovered that I loved it. And then after many, many years, I was like, okay, I just want to have a break. I wanted to come back to like, you know, doing something different in my life because I had felt that um, after starting to do some international research, I saw, and actually also too, working with a lot of international people. There were a lot of uh, people from other countries that worked at Microsoft. And I also got exposed to working with people around the globe. Um, I'll talk about some more of the specifics of that too, but that was just, um, something that I really loved. And I wanted to have the experience of being uncomfortable and being in a, in a culture where I didn't speak the language natively and having the experience that so many immigrants come to the US not speaking English or speaking some English have. And the role of creating technology is also a really key role in, uh, in the globalization of the world. And so I wanted to have that experience. I also wanted to have a break and study you know, poetry and, and French. Um, and then as uh, about, I got about five months into it, I was supposed to actually take a year off and I got five months off. So I'm, uh, I'm proud that I at least got five months off. My husband was like, you know, we, we wanted to try this like company idea. So maybe now is a good time. I said, okay, yeah, that's a good, it's, it's a good time. Um, and so we started the company and he had a company in Washington state because we uh, lived in Washington. Um, and, but we were living in France and then it was just, it just started off as myself as a freelancer uh, doing international research. And it was just a thing that I discovered at Microsoft is, that I loved. And I just wanted to do more of that because I, I see so much opportunity as the world is, uh, becoming more flat, uh, mm -hmm. to use the, the phrase from Thomas Friedman. Um, and I think that as we're starting to develop products that are not just successful in a single market, we need to start thinking globally in terms of how we actually design and develop products. So that was kind of the initial like start of it. It was myself as a freelancer with my husband as my like business partner. And then um, over the last few years, we've grown uh, significantly, which has been a, a fun journey as well. So that's kind of the, the initial impetus. 
So I love that story. And I think a, a really great takeaway here. So one of the things we're doing with the speaker series is bringing in people who um, have done uh, a really wide uh, variety of, have had a built a variety of careers off of um, the kernel of, of UX. And yeah. I think given, you know, some of the changes we're seeing in the tech industry and what's happening with the job market, hearing from these different perspectives is um, uh, really important. And what I love is the lack of intentionality in what you did and sort of, <laughs> you know, being open to opportunities that might present themselves um, and how the UX um, uh, skill set can be really helpful in contexts we might not have uh, considered uh, previously. So I have some other questions about this, but I'm going to let you go ahead and get started with your talk and I'll save them for the end if okay. if students don't have uh, more questions. Um, I will be monitoring the chat. So I'll say to everybody, if you have questions for Josh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and uh, Josh, do you prefer to hold questions to the end or would you like to? No, just interrupt me. Okay. I'll pause. Uh... And then just in our, and just ask them. I think it's it's better to get them in context. Okay, um, it'll be easier. Great. So uh, for those of you who have questions, you can either jump in or feel free to put it in the chat, and and I'll um, I'll be the interrupter if you like. So all right. Awesome. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Thank, Thank you, you for so monitoring the chat. Um, I, I have this this I, this talk is called interpreting cross cultural data, but I'm going to look at culture from a few different perspectives. My own personal journey. Um, and then kind of like different ways that other people are thinking and talking about culture. Uh, key factors to consider while we're looking at cross-cultural data. And then I actually created like steps to interpreting cross-cultural data. Um, depending on how much time and how many questions there are, the, the last section might be a little fast, but I'll, I'll send the slides uh, to Beth so she can send to everyone. And, um, and that has a lot of links at the end for uh, references where you can dig in and just learn more about it. Uh, so when I start thinking about my own cross-cultural journey, uh, there's this great uh, commencement speech by Steve Jobs where he talks about how when you look back at the past, there's a bunch of dots that are connected that show you where you are. But if you look at like forward into the future, it's just a bunch of dots. And that's really what my story is, is like because I didn't know where I wanted to go. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And as I look back at the past, I'm like, oh yeah, there are these touch points where I started noticing that I was really interested both in, in the international space in general, just international people, travel and the world and seeing the world through a new lens. And so that's part of where I'm gonna show you those dots as I look back to the past and it's gonna look totally like it makes a lot of sense. But as, as uh, I already said, it's, it, it wasn't, uh, I was just being open. And I think that that as we were moving forward and trying to figure out what we want to do with our lives, just pick the thing that like looks good to right now and then you adjust as you go. So uh, the first step in this process was uh, way back in uh, 1997 um, when I was actually still in high school and I had the opportunity, but it was an opportunity not taken uh, to be a foreign exchange student in Heidelberg, Germany. And I look back at that and I say, wow, you know, my life would have been really different had I taken that opportunity. And I can say like, oh, you know, I, I really wish that I had the opportunity to just think like, oh yeah, you know, I just, I thought that going to college was so important and I had to graduate high school in four years. And like, I was really studious, <clears throat> excuse me. And I look back and I was thinking, yeah, you know, that would have been really fun uh, because I had taken four years of German uh, through high school um, and so this would have been like, you know, one of those years, it would have extended my high school time. Um, and my family actually grew up in a kind of a French and like, I'm half French and half German, basically, um, as an American, I grew up in uh, Fresno, California. And, uh, but I used to, like, go sing hymns in German at church. So it was like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. I would like, you know, I wanted to learn German. Um, and I think that this would have been a really interesting opportunity uh, because I, I saw even back then that was a, a thing that was really interesting to me. Moving forward in time a little bit more, um, as I was actually, while I was in the uh, grad program at, uh, at UW and HCDE, now formerly technical communication at the time, I was actually working at Microsoft. My first uh, contract at Microsoft was as a web developer and localization PM. And I had, after my undergrad started 
just some basic HTML, CSS classes. And then I got this job as a web developer. And then I kind of took on all the localization program management from someone else who was working on it and then like had a contract end and I just like took it over. So suddenly I was working on a website in English and then eight international languages. And I would work with the different subsidiaries all over the globe, talk about the translation, work on translation memory with our translation partner. And it was a really cool experience because I, I learned not only like how cool it is to work with people from eight different countries, uh, and then also just the experience of creating a website uh, online. And so I was actually in grad school when I had this, this job, which was so cool. And I just felt like, wow, you know, this is, this is really neat. To fast forward a little bit more to 2013 uh, was my first big international ethnography that I worked on. I was at Microsoft at the time and I was the research manager for a, uh, a content organization um, that eventually kind of like merged with MSN and anyway, but we were looking at the, um, this was back in the, uh, the days of Windows 8 and building tablet apps. So I was one of the first researchers at Microsoft that was doing uh, ethnographies uh, in the US on how people used iPads at home. And then we were looking at content consumption, both on the web, but also on phones and tablets. And so I did this big international ethnography in Brazil, China, and Japan in 2013. And we were looking at how people look for information online, be it at home, on their phones, laptops, or tablets. Um, so this was all uh, a really, really cool study. And it, I, ironically, I met my Italian Brazilian husband whose hometown is Sao Paulo, but I met him in Tokyo um, during this trip and we got married about three months later. So uh, he's kind of all over the map in terms of like his uh, cultural interests and background as well. Um, and to meet him in Japan after I was in his hometown, <laughs> excuse me, a couple of months earlier, or just, sorry, a couple of weeks earlier, it was just, it was really funny. Um, so this was a, a big moment for me, and I and I loved it. This was my first time in all three of these countries. Um, and actually, just as a, a, a little fun personal side note, we're going to be in uh, Japan 10 years to the day that we met uh, this this coming April. So that's a, it's a nice little, little uh, way to celebrate an anniversary. And we actually celebrate our uh, anniversary every year with Japanese food because we met in Japan. So Japan's a really special uh, country for us. And then in 2019, that's when I actually decided uh, I had been to France, uh, to Paris specifically three times in a row, and I wanted to take a sabbatical to just really focus on learning French and out of that created Amplinate uh, and just wanted to, to focus on cross-cultural research. Again, this is this makes so much sense when I tell it in this way, but as I look, this is looking backwards. Now looking forwards, it's, it's also been an interesting journey because part of what we have done in Amplinate ends up focusing on a lot of marginalized populations around the world, which has been really, really cool because being a queer owned uh, company, we get a lot of uh, people that are like looking to us to help uh, understand the queer experience in uh, other countries, which I think is really, really cool. So it's kind of a, a thing that I didn't set out to do, but it's a thing that makes a ton of sense um, as, as we're looking uh, backwards again. So that's kind of the, the, the gist of the journey. I want to talk a little bit more on like three different ways of thinking about culture. So to start, uh, I, I found this uh, this definition of culture from Robert Garland at Colgate University. Culture is how a people behaves, lives, thinks, what their values and aspirations are, and how they see themselves as a people. I really like this because I thought that it it started with a, a good like, okay, here's a stake in the ground. This is this is what culture is. It's, it's how, we think, how we see ourselves, what we value, and how can we understand not only our own culture, but how do we start understanding other cultures? That's the big question. So we're going to get into that one. Next one is uh, from David Foster Wallace from his own commencement speech uh, entitled This is Water. And uh, he talks about how there's these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swam on for a bit. And eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? And I thought that was like, this is it. Culture is, is like water. You don't realize that you're in it until you leave it. And all of a sudden you have a new perspective both on your own culture, but on that other culture. And that's been my experience in travel, but also my experience in moving to another country. 
And uh, in the last three years, like even just in the last year, in 2022, I spent about two weeks in the USA. Uh, most of my time is, uh, I spend most of my time in Paris, France. Um, and then I actually spend, uh, this year we're spending three months in, in Mexico to skip winter. So uh, it's, it's really interesting uh, as I start living my, more and more of my life, not in English, even though my work is in English and my, uh, my, my relationship with my husband is in English, though we speak sometimes in a little bit of Portuguese, a little bit of French and mostly English. Um, so it's kind of fun uh, to kind of exist kind of in this in-between state. Um, but anyway, as a, as a metaphor, I like this idea of, of culture being like water. And then the last one, I'm drawing from uh, Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows. And the, the, look, the view of culture as a complex system of meaning making and, and how we create meaning based on the things around us. And it's not necessarily what I think something means, but what does it mean for those people that are in that culture? How does a product function in a complex system that involves life, work, friend groups, other cultures. It's a, it's a very, very complex uh, system. And if you approach it from a system theory kind of perspective, it's also important to look at how culture is not static because it's really dynamic. It's constantly changing and evolving and it changes as we are part of it and as we observe it, as well as irrespective of us being there at all. So there's the kind of the observer but then there's still this whole system that just functions as it goes. Uh, so that's an, the third way of kind of looking, looking at culture. And then uh, in her book, I, I love this book, by the way, highly recommended if you're at all interested in system theory. But she talks about the, the Sufi story of the blind men and the elephant and how each person comes up, grabs a different part of the elephant and says, oh, it's like a snake or, oh, it's like a tree trunk. Oh, it's like a wall. Uh, and then, what she says here is that the, the ancient Sufi story was told to teach a simple lesson, but one that we often ignore. The behavior of a system cannot be known just by knowing the elements of, what the, of which the system is made. So we can talk about culture as this complex system. And yeah, there are these different elements that the, the system is made. There's, there's the language, that's an element of culture. There are behaviors and customs, that's, that's a part of culture. There's the food. But just knowing those elements doesn't mean that we understand the complexity of the system. We have to dig in and like see it and, and learn more. So the rest of this is really going to be about how to do that. <laughs> and I think about cross-cultural research as kind of this combination of semiotics, anthropology, and product strategy. Semiotics, of course, being how do we create meaning? Anthropology being how do we understand other cultures? And product strategy being how do we build a product that solves people's needs? We put those three in together and mix it all up in the pot, and that's how we get cross-cultural research. And I wanna pause for a moment and say, when I talk about cross-cultural research, it doesn't have to be cross-market research. It doesn't have to be a different country because in the USA, we have many, many subcultures. And that is that doesn't mean that, like we can do cross-cultural research in the USA. If, uh, if we're looking at the queer community and you're not queer, well, that's cross-cultural research. It's kind of, a, it's, it's a cross-cultural research for me as a queer person to do research with straight people. Now, I think that there are some, you know, nuances obviously and differences between how that works and how it works to look at people in another culture existing in another system, because to some extent we are existing in the same system of the USA and how the US culture works. But because of all these microcultures that are in a part of the US, it is fair to talk about cross-cultural research in within a market as well. I think I'll pause there because I think this is the end of the uh, section. Oh, I have a couple more slides. Are there any questions so far before I? Uh... No, okay. Not so far. So, good, good. Uh, so another another thing to talk about is our lens. And as a researcher and a participant, imagine that we each have a lens that we're looking through. They're like glasses. We see the world through our own glasses, our own cultural lenses. And uh, I'm just gonna use reference culture and foreign culture. And for the sake of simplicity, I'll just use reference culture as the USA, American culture. I did grow up in, uh, in Fresno, California. I am an American citizen, though I do not live in the US right now. So my reference is as an American, and yet I see the world through the lens of an American. 
And as a researcher, if I'm doing research with someone from another culture, it's important to be aware that I'm seeing that other that person and that other culture through the lens of what it is to be American. And are we aware of it? Some things we are aware of, but other things we are less aware of. So if we're looking from a reference culture, uh, we kind of have like our value systems, which is what we think, believe, and notice about the world around us. Those value systems, they're, most of them are pretty aware of what our values are. Maybe you haven't defined them, but, uh, but if you think about it for a minute, we kind of know like it's uh, as an, an American, this is a fun one, um, as a American having reverse culture shock coming back to the US, I, I see things like, oh, how loud everything is everywhere, how many ads there are all over the place. Um, I start seeing my own culture in these new ways. And I'm like, oh, wow, they, they brought me the check. I'm not done yet. You know, they, these are things that are very American in terms of our, our value system, because as, a, as an American culture, we value efficiency. And I probably had the fastest, like I had global entry and I came in and my fastest like global entry ever <laughs> happened. I was literally 10 seconds. They took a picture. There was no printout. I didn't even show my passport. Someone was like, oh, hey, Mr. Lamar. Like, yes, okay. And I just walked through. And I'm like, this is, a, this is where efficiency works really, really well. And so if you're, you're coming at looking at another culture through this lens of efficiency, all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, these people waste so much time in all these other cultures. Well, they don't see it as wasting time because they don't have the same value of efficiency. Maybe in France, their value isn't efficiency. Their value is spending time with each other. So if you are at a restaurant, they're not gonna bring you the check because you're racing to leave. Food should be enjoyed, food should be appreciated. And so this is a, a really good example of how you can have a, a cross-cultural miscommunication. Now, there's also your unconscious le level of confirmation bias and just bias in general. You might have biases that you're unaware of that impact your ability to think, believe, and notice and what you think, believe, and notice about those other cultures. Now, in that foreign culture perspective, there's an objective and a subjective way of looking at things. There's, you know, objectively, you can see like actions and behaviors, what do people do? And then there's subjectively what they say and believe about what they do. And again, these are also very different things. Even within the same culture, we have a difficult time kind of teasing apart these differences between what people say and what they do because they don't always match up. And then you throw this other layer of culture in and that's where it gets really complicated. So imagine like, here's me, I'm looking through my US lens at this person in another culture who's evaluating not only this American product through their foreign lens, but also there's a local company that they're evaluating as well and comparing. So as I think being aware of all of these layers of uh, the uh, aware, the conscious and unconscious bias and awareness of your own lens and other people's lenses as well. Because again, that research participant may not be aware of their own unconscious bias when they're evaluating an American product. And that's also interesting. So if this got really complex, it is. And now we're gonna tease it apart and make it easier. So three uh, factors I think to consider. Communication styles is a really important one. Uh, as a, a, a super easy one, there's direct versus indirect communication. Now on one side of the spectrum, you'll have Germany and the Netherlands, they're extremely direct. They say exactly what they think. And the US is, and Americans are typically much more on the direct side of communication. We say what we mean, mean what we say, this is what I think. Um, Germany and Netherlands are a bit even more too direct for Americans because Americans don't like uh, negative feed, negative criticism or feedback. And that's what, that's a whole a separate dimension actually of communication is giving negative feedback where the US will be completely different than the rest of the world because we're direct in our communication except if it comes to negative feedback. Um, versus on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, the, the UK as well as uh, Japan, which is extremely indirect. So it, there's this phrase that we always joke about with my British friends, my only concern. So you're doing, you're imagining you're doing a research uh, like a usability study in the UK and, and the participant says, you know, what did you think about your experience? Oh, well, 
you know, I really liked this. I really like this. I'm glad that it does this. My only concern is that it doesn't do X. Now, as an American, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, everything is great. They really like it. We just have to fix this one thing. And in British, it means this is a deal breaker. And if you don't fix this thing, I will not use it. But they can't say that. They don't say it that directly. They have to say it indirectly. And you really have to read between the lines. And whenever we do research in the UK, we have British moderators and we even interview them afterwards and say like, we had a, like a quiz, like, hey, the participant said this, what do you, what did they really mean? And then we'd have the British person, like moderator tell us like, oh yeah, no, they actually hate it. They have to do this. And like, we're just like, the team is shocked. <laughs> so this is a fun one. There's also implied versus stated confirmation. In some cultures, if you say like, oh, hey, I need to have this by this time, they just will do it and it'll be ready. But in, a, in the USA, we have to have a very like explicitly stated confirmation. Yes, I will do X at this time. And it, it's not the same everywhere else. Whereas other cultures, like in India, as an example, they would see the US as like, oh, why are they so explicit? Why are they so direct all the time? Like, I, like, I know what we're working on. Of course, I'm going to get it done in time. But we need that confirmation. Um, and, and similarly, like when you're conducting uh, international research, your moderation style might differ between markets and what you might consider rude isn't necessarily rude in another culture. So in Germany, if someone just directly like ask these questions, like bam, 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 it's fine. Like the participant is used to that. They, this is just how communication happens in German. Uh, it, it might come across as rude to an American, but that doesn't mean that it's rude to them. And that's a, a key distinction. Um, work habits are another one. <clears throat> time time zones and working hours, like just navigating that, that's a that's an important one. Uh, they have different laws. Like in Germany, you can't work. Uh, and by work, I mean, they cannot answer an email after working hours or they get fined. Uh, so it's important to understand how these other things might, might impact your ability to do research. Uh, the perception of time is another one. Like uh, it, if anyone's heard of Latin time, um, it's very different because in the US, we perceive time as absolute and specific. And in Brazil, there's a, a great example in a book that I'll reference in a minute about how this, the speaker was, was giving a, a lecture to a class in, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and ended on time, thinking from her American's perspective that that was being respectful of their time and got this horrible feedback afterwards, like, hey, this was so great. Everyone was so engaged. Why did you end so early? Well, it was because they were trying to be on time, which as an American, we have this, this cultural standard of like, you know, being on time. And yet in Brazil, it doesn't work like that. If you're enjoying the moment and having a great conversation, that is more important than whatever else is going on. Uh, local laws and customs are another aspect of culture that impacts our ability to do cross-cultural research. And it's just a thing that you have to, you know, take into account. So uh, as an example, in France, when you're trying to do research, you can't actually ask about skin color because it's just, it's illegal. You can't do that. Um, and there are ways that you ask, you know, different questions like, oh, hey, where, where were you, did you grow up? Are you from another country? You can ask and, you know, maybe assume, but you can't necessarily ask about skin color. Whereas in the US, that's, that's something we often do where if we're looking at research with the black community. Uh, there might be, I mentioned the, the local laws and off working hours in Germany. There's also religious holidays that you have to know about. If you're doing research in a predominantly Muslim country, you cannot do your research during Ramadan. This is the thing where people are just not going to be available. And we had to explain this to one of our clients and we're like, hey, you know, this is Ramadan. You can't, we can't do the research this time. Like, I know you want it to happen, but it's not going to be possible. Um, and then national holidays, uh, like for example, Carnival in uh, in Brazil, which is uh, you know coming up in uh, I think it's end of February. The whole country takes the the time off. It's like two weeks off. It just doesn't happen. And so you have to be flexible. You have to you have to like figure it out. Like know what's going on. That's where you talk to uh, a Brazilian person or someone that is uh, you know in the recruitment company that maybe you're working with, uh, who knows and understands the culture. Or your moderator. Um, and that's, that's where you're going to like learn about these things and you have to be flexible with them because you can't just 
think that you can do it in the American way that like, oh no, it doesn't matter. It's just a holiday. Like we can, you know, we can work. Like, no, that's not how it works in other countries. And like August, August in Europe is like, you know, pretty, pretty dead because people mostly take the, the month off. So if you want to do research in Europe in August, like probably not going to happen. Like it'll get pushed out to, you know, September or it happens in, in July. So things, things to be aware of here. And there's also this like cultural perception of your company and your brand. And this happens a lot, especially in uh, Southeast Asia, as well as you know, China and Japan. There's this perception of from the USA or from the West versus from a local company. And this idea of made for us versus made for them. Whenever you're, you have a, a product that is designed and built within a single market for that market, it's, it's made for us. We know who we are culturally versus, oh, well, this is just an American company trying to you know, push their product on us, but they don't understand who we are. And uh, just another kind of like little fun fact here, just on localization of brand names. Uh, we see it, there's probably in almost every, every project that we work on, there's something in terms of localization that's a problem, just like the way that the brand name is translated or not translated. And we had one in France where the, the brand name was close to a French word, um, but it was missing an accent. And so French people thought that it was just misspelled and meant something completely different than what it meant in English. And in English, the word you know, made sense, but they didn't necessarily know that word in English. They thought it was just misspelled in French. And so these kinds of things come up all the time. And it's really important to understand what words mean and if their, their meaning is just not coming through. So I'm going to pause for a moment to see uh, time check plus questions. Oh, we're doing good so on time. We've got about uh, about 17 minutes left in the class and uh, lots of comments of people having similar sorts of issue uh, encounters cross-culturally, but no specific questions. Okay, awesome. I'm going to keep moving forward and uh, I'll still go a little, a little quick through this so that we can do some more questions at the end. Because this section is, uh, it's longer, but I can also do it faster. <laughs> so how do we do this? All right. The first place to start is to really up-level your insights with some experiential immersion. And by that, I mean, learn as much as you can about that new culture. You can do it through books, articles, documentaries, other secondary sources. And it might seem basic, but most people skip this. And the goal is to create opportunities for connection because when you are talking to someone from another culture, it's really important to have a sense of maybe where it is on the map, what the history and politics are of that, that uh, country, what language they speak, maybe even some words that you can learn in that language. What are their you know, famous like artists or musicians, uh, works of literature? Food, food's a real easy one. Like, it's so exciting to explore the world through food. Can you find a restaurant that's near you where you can try that? And people love talking about food. Like, oh, you're from you know, some country I've never been to. Like, what is, your, what is your favorite food that you have there? Everyone loves to talk about food. And this is deeper than desk research. This is not, I spent an hour in Google and did some Google searches. This is like experiential learning about a culture through these different lenses. Because again, it's about creating opportunities for connection when you're actually talking to that person. If you have no idea what language they speak and you're like, oh, you're Brazil. Do you speak Spanish in Brazil? Like, no, they don't speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese. Like learn enough about the just basics of the history of, of, the, of the culture and, and you're not gonna come across like a completely ignorant person. Like you wanna like have something you can kind of hold on to. I have a whole bunch of different uh, prompts here, uh, and I'll let you review these on your own uh, in the slides. But these are some of the things that we talked about with maps. Where is it on the map? I can't even tell you the number of times that we've done research and the client didn't know where the country was on the map. Politics. Language. Can you say hello? How do you say please and thank you? How do you say goodbye? Can you just incorporate little things like saying hello and, and goodbye in your email? Like little things make a huge difference because it shows that you care and it shows them that you're reaching out to them. 
Interestingly too. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to jump in. Nina's got a question here um, <clears throat> about sort of, you know, appreciating the quotes and stories. Uh, she's curious to hear your advice or guidance on how we can help others who may not be as aware or more importantly, care about cross-cultural components to recognize its importance. So if you have an example Oof. at work, uh, I should love to hear it. I mean, since you're running your own consultancy, you get to decide what matters, but maybe you've worked with clients who don't see the importance of building this kind of understanding. Any any guidance to share there on how to uh, help people understand the importance? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one because I think that typically when we're working with a client, they already get it and like already know that they want to go like, or maybe they have a product. They're like, oh, we're releasing this in, you know, Indonesia. So <laughs> like it's already, the decision's already made. It's already there. So they're kind of usually like, that's not the the thing to, uh, that we need, we need to have a, a lot of insight. Uh, like we don't have to like push that agenda. It's already there. But to, to answer the question, I think that it's important to look at, and this is this is actually where I think business and design kind of like come together in this realm of like product or product strategy, because it's important to understand like where your product is being used and how much we know about the audience of those locations in the world where that product is being used. Because the typical strategy, and then I have a slide on this in localization later, so maybe I'll just, I'll pause the localization discussion for, for a little bit later. Um, but essentially you can, you can calculate your impact and ROI. If you just look at how you are like, imagine like your product resonates with most people, but you know, nothing about France. So let's do some research in France to understand if it's the same, if it's different and what we can do differently. Um, because as, as soon as you start talking in numbers, and like, oh yeah, people are confused by this. Well, they're not gonna use something they're confused by, or they're not gonna use something that solves a problem they don't have. So as soon as we validate that those are the problems that they have, and they are the same problems, and the solution like addresses those problems in the best way, suddenly you're, you're able to start saying, well, this is a, a product that's gonna, you know, hopefully be more successful in this other market as well. So we've got a couple other questions, but I'm going to let you get through a few more slides before I jump in. There. Okay. <laughs> uh, art, music, literature, food. Again, I mentioned all of these. So the, the, all of this step one is really about learn something so that then you can connect with others. And that could be friends, it could be coworkers, maybe you have employees in a satellite office from that culture. And really ask questions and be curious and seek to understand what their perspective is. Um, not to explain to them what you think about their culture, but just ask, you know, interesting questions and, and listen, because this is something that allows us to really, really make connections with people. And it's interesting that uh, and simultaneous interpreters actually allow for connection to happen despite language barriers. I've been in Brazil speaking through a simultaneous interpreter and having those real human conversations and real connections with people. And it can actually happen online as well. And it's really surprising because you forget that the person is there. You just have this little whisper in your ear that tells you everything in English. And it's amazing. And I remember uh, I was in Brazil and the, uh, the simultaneous interpreter had like gone to the bathroom or something. And the participant just starts speaking to me in Portuguese. And I was like, I don't understand you. <laughs> and it's just this moment of like, and we both laughed because we had both kind of forgotten that we, that that person was there. And so that connection piece is really important in order to understand the person so that you can understand the culture. And then next is like, as in a more formal type of setting, if you're observing interactions through ethnography, you're actually there, you're in person and you're, you're observing what's going on and you're talking to people as, as things are going on. And as we're looking at, at cross-cultural ethnography, like it's, it's really important to not oversimplify, overgeneralize, exoticize or otherize the other person. It's, it's eva or evaluate from your own lens. Again, it's not about what I think, it's about what they think. It's about what they, how they see themselves. And it's really important to just like write down all of our hypotheses and then just set them aside and just be open. Just figure out what, what matters to them. And I, oh, I love this idea. Step into their water, step into their pool. 
and that's if we just keep this idea of, of culture as, as water if there's another like there's a pond i'm in the usa pond right now and i jump into another pond i'm suddenly in this whole new ecosystem what does that feel like to me how do i see that culture differently like what does this pond feel like compared to this other pond how do they see their pond well they don't they don't see their pond they don't realize that it's there but it allows some really interesting observations um, and there's a, a cultural dimension theories that you can use. I've, I have three of them here by uh, Aaron Meyer, Edward Hall, and Garrett Hofstede's uh, dimensions model. I have links in the appendix. Um, I will make a plug to the culture map by Aaron Meyer. She's an American that lives and teaches in France and uh, has, I actually buy this book for every one of our employees because we do so much cross-cultural communication and it's about the different dimensions of um, culture, one of them being the indirect versus direct communication, another one being the perception of time, another one is the giving of negative feedback. Um, again, there, there's these three different models that you can use that have some similarities, um, but this will be a, a helpful kind of starting point because then you can use that as a, a starting point to really look at these are the dimensions, but if we go back to this idea of the, uh, the blind men and the elephant, and the meaning of the story, it's its not just knowing the parts means that you can understand the whole. It means that you can have a starting point to start understanding the system and digging in. So another piece here is to check your assumptions and that going back to the idea of your own cultural lens, your mental model of the world and how you interpret the world around you comes from your own cultural lens as well as your own personal lens. So I see the world as an American, but I see the world as an American that lives in France and that is a queer person as a, as a starting point. Um, and so it's important to understand not only what are the lenses that I see the world through, but how do I understand knowing that lens can affect maybe some biases. And notice your response to things when people are, are talking to you. If, if you have like a positive or negative response, it's an opportunity to say like, huh, if something is coming up, why are you having that response, positive or negative? And I have a, a really fun story about Japan. When I was doing research there, um, we were looking at a web page in a, in a tablet app. And the, the participant said like, oh, this is such a luxurious use of space. And you know, Americans have this, especially American design has a value of white space. And there was a lot of white space on this news app. And I, I thought, oh, that's really great. The participant really likes this. this. And, like, and I said, okay, well, you know, tell me more about that. And she said, well, there's all this like wasted space. You could add a little character here. You can add more information over here. The cultural value in Japan is about breadth of information. It's not about white space. It's about show me everything. And if you've seen any web pages in Japan or in Japanese, it's like overwhelming, but that's what they want. They wanna see everything. So whenever you have an assumption, set it aside and then say, okay, tell me more and understand what, uh, what they think. I mentioned this already, so I'll just go quickly through this one, approaching with openness and curiosity. Um, again, it's not our job to really evaluate the system. It's our job to understand how they evaluate the, the system or the topic or the product. We've got about five minutes left for the class. Okay. Um, why don't you, can you get us to the end? There's a couple of questions here I think yep. you can enjoy. Yep, yep. Uh, again, uncover what it means to them. Thick description. There's a thing you can dig into if you want to learn more. And then localization. I am just gonna jump to this. So the, the biggest difficulty when it comes to localization is a copy paste translation on the left where you basically say like, okay, here's the website in English. Let's put it in. French and just assume that it's fine. You have the same code base, it saves time, it's less expensive, but it could seem irrelevant or even worse, culturally imperialist to your audience. And then on the flip side, you have a fully localized site that is so authentic and bespoke to the, to the culture, it feels like it came from within, but of course it's gonna take time and money and maybe even develop a whole separate product for them. There's something in the middle that I think is the, the goal. And it's the user-centered design process that helps us understand what can we use from this existing product, but how can we adapt it in such a way that's not you know, gonna be hugely um, 
time and cost intensive in developing a whole new product because there's still a core to that product, but how can you tweak it to make sense to a uh, another audience? So we get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. And that's really the point of what's going on here. We're creating meaning together and we're creating meaning based on what we want our product to do. So that's the end. Thank you. I have contact information. I have recommended reading as well. <laughs> um, and here are the, the cultural theories. Fantastic. So I will uh, share these slides um, with the class via Canvas when I get them from Josh. So someone asks, if you're working on a cross-cultural project, so this is totally germane to the last section there, mm -hmm. but if you had a time limitation and you don't have any prior knowledge, what tips would you have to efficiently get to understand the broad aspects of a different culture? I mean, do something. Like it doesn't have to be this big, massive study in order to learn something. Research doesn't exist in a vacuum and learning something about that other market is gonna help you develop more in the future and figure out what to do next. So I just say, do something, talk, do some informal interviews with colleagues from that country or potentially, you know, participants in that other country. Most of Northern Europe speaks English too. That's a total benefit. You can do a lot of things in English. Um, and it's it's really more of like, like how can you get to those people and how, to, how can you talk to them? Um, so, but, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> Go. Um, so I think that's an awesome piece of advice. So like, because you had this long list of things that you can do. And I think the important takeaway here is just do something. You don't have to do all of the things, yeah. but at least do something. So thank you for yeah. that. So here's another question. Um, have you ever unintentionally offended someone that you worked with or interviewed uh, because of a cultural miscommunication? And if so, how did you deal with the situation? You know, it's... <sighs> The thing is, you don't always necessarily know if you offended someone. Um, so I think that there, there are opportunities for miscommunication all the time. And uh, some of the advice in the book when that happens is to just be upfront of like, you know, I'm an American and I, I'm going to I'm going to be really explicit and I'm going to ask you things to like confirm. And that's just from where I'm, I'm coming from. So please, you know, don't, don't take it offensively. Um, I think it's, it's really important to be aware of how you're communicating and what you're doing and do it in such a way that you give that other person the opportunity to share, was that message in, received as the way that it was intended or not? Like in it's, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> um, I'm gonna jump in with a question here. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions for the students who are here? Um, and I think we might have some bachelors as well as master students, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, who are thinking, oh, I might want to actually um, do UX in an international context. How might they prepare any particular classes or ways to um, position themselves for work like this? Yeah, I, I would say that um, probably one of the biggest things to start with is like make sure that your language skills in that other culture are like really, really good. Um, and I moved to France because I wanted to move to France. Um, but that doesn't mean that I like I, I, I actually did get a job offer in France. Um, but my my French was like, Ur! and then over time, it's gotten a lot a lot better. I've actually moderated in French a few times, um, which is really fun now. But then like, you know, it, it's definitely like you have to commit to uh, that 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 other culture. And there's a whole process of culture shock that you're going to go through as well. And if you're not really familiar with that culture or the process of culture shock, it's it you know it, it's it definitely can be really difficult. So I think that you know if you don't want to make that decision and just like go all in and get there and be like oh, I really don't like it here. And the thing about other cultures is that they're different. There is whole different systems. There are different pools that you're going to exist in. And what matters is that you're not trying to force your own mindset on how it should be. You have to kind of lean back into, this is how it is here. And it's not better or worse, it's just different. And mm -hmm. so I think that like moving the direction of you know, working cross-culturally uh, and doing research internationally, you know, you're, you're gonna wanna commit to whatever culture that is and really commit to it, but it's not an easy decision or, and my or guess a quick is one. You can take cult, that culture shock experience and turn that into uh, research as well. So yeah, sort of yeah. autoethnography. 
Um, so with that, we are at time. Um, thank you so much uh, for gosh, sharing all of this background and expertise. I know there's been a bunch of requests for the slides, <coughs> including students not enrolled in the class. And, Excellent. <laughs> um, I, you know, go ahead. I would say take some time to uh, look at the chat. Um, if you if you have the time, you might. There's some. Uh, I will. There. So thank you so much, Josh. I'm going to give you a round of applause. It was one of the challenges with the online presentations. Um, yes. So wonderful to have you join us. Really appreciate it. And um, that, I mean, I'll hang out if anybody has questions or Josh, if you want to chat about anything, but that concludes our talk for today. Thank you, everybody.